My name is Sabrina Broadhead. You've heard Evelyn um, refer to me very casually, and that's because um, her and I have a relationship going back to when I was a little girl, and she used to babysit our family, and actually spent some time living with our family. So that's why she kind of just uh, is very casual about that. Um, I work with the Division of Aboriginal Health and Community Wellness. I'm the director. My job is to work with the young team that is um, working in the health and wellness area in the government of the Northwest Territories. And I've been asked to chair this, this piece. Um, yesterday we had a profiling of a NWT programs and it was a focus on the people whose home we're, we're visiting. Oh, Joe, now you're not nervous anymore. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Like, really? Okay, is that good? Okay, you all can hear me? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Migwans, and I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, just to share some stuff about our program, uh, Jackson Lake Wellness. I work with the Jackson Lake Wellness team. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers that came before me here. There's a lot of interesting stuff that I've heard so far, and um, uh, I'd just like to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Ojibwe. I'm from Manitoulin Island, Ontario, but I've been living in the Yukon for almost 30 years. Uh, I have a son and a daughter and a wife, and um, we're doing all good. Um, we have a little dog named Mimsy. He's doing good. <laughs> well, he actually is a she, but I always call him a he. He acts like a guy. <laughs> um, yeah, and... Um, I'm Ojibwe, I moved to the Yukon quite a few years ago and um, actually I'm adopted into the Wolf Clan in champagne actually, and uh, to a family there. And I'm of the Wolf Clan. Um, I got an Indian name, my na Indian name is um, Gathala in uh, Southern Tushone. I was named after Moose Johnson in Burwash. And Patty Jim and the rest of the family named me that because um, I guess Moose Johnson was a really happy guy. And he had a lot of fun all the time wherever he went and he made a lot of people laugh with his stories and stuff. And um, so that's why Patty gave me that name. And I also have an Indian name from, from where I come from. And uh, my Indian name there is Degunene. And Degunene means drum man. And at that time when I was given that name, the elders, um, my grandma and another elder in the in our community, they gave me that name, and I didn't actually know that I would be making drums in the future. And so my name is Drum Man, and also Gathala, but I'm not sure what Gathala means. Um, they didn't exactly know what that meant, but it it just refers to the happy guy. So. Um, 
That's me in a nutshell. Uh, I was um, I was actually had the opportunity to come and work here in um, Northwest Territories before too. I used to work with um, the Friendship Center, uh, Skookum Jim Friendship Center, and I used to run a program called Traditional Parenting Program. And we did training in Betchico. And a lot of people came there from all over the communities. And I had to come back and do follow-up with the communities. And I flew around to some communities here, like uh, Gamity and Wekwiti and Wati. And, um, and we did uh, uh, three day traditional parenting workshops in those communities. So I have um, some experience with uh, Fort Simpson. Um, there's another community down by Fort Liard. Nahani, Nahani Butte, I flew in there too. On the way down there, we saw a moose. It was pretty neat flying around in a small little plane around here. It was kind of scary, but it was good. It was a nice experience, it was awesome. So I met a lot of people around here, and I met this one guy, his name is Joe Migwi in uh, Betrico. He's a pretty, he was a pretty fun guy. Uh, I had, everywhere I went, I actually had to have a, a interpreter, translator. And um, Joe Migwi told me stories, and we had a really good time. And I think, um, from my experience, I've been learning lots from elders. Um, I had a lot of teachings from elders. I've, um, when I first started making drums, I was with elders. And um, actually in Champion Ajac with uh, Sam Williams, and I called him Grandpa Sam. And I asked Grandpa Sam one day, I said, Grandpa, do you know how to make drums? He said, no, but it can't be that hard. All you need is a circle and some hide. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. We, we, we started out, and next thing you know, we're, we're like, um, I don't know, almost a year before we all figured out everything. And it was in 13 years later that I actually learned how to make a drum. So it is, there is quite, quite a lot to it. If you, if you don't know nothing, we started right from scratch. And on that basis and in that context, our, our, our um, program at Jackson Lake Wellness is based on that largely, is the cultural knowledge but as well as we have the clinical stuff as well, uh, clinical counselor. So with that, I'll just um, get into the uh, presentation. I was I read on the email it said it wasn't necessary to bring a uh, PowerPoint, so I just brought the paper. <laughs> and um, my colleague here and friend Natasha is going to have her PowerPoint and dazzle you with her presentation. So. What I'm going to do is just read off this paper and um, just tell you a little bit about what our program is like and how it got started. And so my role as a cultural counselor is to work with the team to help build a cultural foundation under an all Jackson Wellness Program services, outreach, supports, and crisis response. I also provide cultural counseling to individuals, couples, families, using traditional teachings, values, prayers, ceremony, stories, making useful traditional items, art, working with medicines and other activities. So those are all things that we do as, um, like for myself as a cultural counselor, but we have out outreach worker as well, two outreach workers. Um, the other members of the team include a coordinator, two community outreach workers, contractors employed to lead the four week program, as well as to provide support for evaluation, policy, and program development. Clinical counseling services and health supports are provided by KDFN Health and Social Development Department. Um, so we do hire contractors to come in to do, operate the, um, or to facilitate the uh, men's program, 28-day program, and we have a women's 28-day program as well. So we run two programs a year, but with that we have aftercare as well. Actually, one of our um, facilitators is here in the, in the group right now, and that's Phil Gattensby. And um, he's right there. And if I forget anything, and I, I'm, I'm gonna count on him to fill us all in. 
Thanks. Okay, so um, the cultural foundation is important for all, for all the program elements, community-based, outreach, and land-based. Uh, the balance between cultural and clinical elements is fundamental to all programming. There is an increasing focus on more intensive trauma work in the programming while continuing to strengthen the cultural base. Uh, the clinical counselor and the cultural, we have to work together because a lot of people have a lot more traumas that sometimes that we can deal with. So they have different skills that we have, but we're, we're basically equal in terms of delivering the program and in the way that we program, but it's largely based in a cultural, in a cultural way, which is what lodge different teachings from the elders, stuff like that. Um, equine therapy, these are things that are happening with the program now, and other alternative complementary methods are being integrated as we go along. We'll start doing some meditating, some meditation stuff as well. Different things like that will help us in the program. The four-week program also has a cultural lead and a, and a on-the-land full-time for the program, which runs 24-7 for four weeks. The role is similar to mine, but more intensive due to the fact that people are living on the land together. The cultural lead works in partnership with the clinical lead. Land-based programming has been active in Kuala Dun First Nations for 25 years. In the last seven years, the funding has been more predictable. In the last three years, uh, we have 500,000 from Health Canada for the Jackson Lake Wellness, uh, has been working with 333,000 from the Yukon government for the four week programs each year, one for men and one for women. At this moment, um, we actually haven't been, um, what do you call, uh, we actually haven't been given the money for the programs, for the summer programs for the men and women. So it's getting kind of late, like we're almost at year end and um, we still don't have confirmation on that, on the dollars. So we're not sure exactly if we're going to be having that this year. I don't even know if I could be saying that right now, but that, that's the reality and that's where we're at right now. Hopefully it will come through in the last minute. If, we, if it does, we'll be ready. Um, our first program is gonna run on May 3rd for the men. And then the second program for the women is in July, um, the middle of July. So the Jackson Lake Wellness Team provides the application, the preparation and support during the programs and aftercare for four weeks, uh, for the four week programs. So we do, uh, after the program takes place, what we do is we follow along, we provide aftercare, we do activities with the people that have taken the program throughout the year. Um, we start off weekly, or daily contact with the people who have left the program. We also um, follow them along quite intensively for the first three months, and then we start slack, not slacking. <laughs> <laughs> Start slacking off. <laughs> just, tell the just tell them the truth. <laughs> but, but after three months, we do we do cut it back um, for two two, um, two meetings a month, um, and then after that, we go to once a month, and um, and then after that, we. We don't offer it at all till our next program. And then we start again. It's just kind of like intensively at the beginning, daily, weekly, monthly, and then every two weeks, and then we go down to once a month. And so now we're at that point of once a month, and um, so next month we'll have another um, meeting, um, aftercare program. But we're all, our phones are always on for them as well. For, for the people, not only the people that have taken the program, but also for all of the Yukon. There are four of us in the office, but we have other resources, contractors as well, um, like Phil and Andy Nyman, and uh, we have 
so we have other people that we can call on in crisis. So anybody that's having trouble, they can call us. We can support them. Um, anything that they're going through, as well as the communities. Um, and I think it's, it says that in here in the next part. So I'll just get back to this. Short, shorter two to five day land-based programs are done at Jackson Lake Wellness Camp and in other locations such as a good place for beaver trapping, fishing and hunting. Much like you've heard in other programs that are happening here, we get back to the land and we do the activities that our, that our, um, our uh, elders have lived, have done and, can, and we want to continue that on learning about the land and how to be with the land and our relationship with the land, but as well as our spirituality. So getting back to the land is very important. Um, youth and elder family. Lately, Kualan Dunn First Nation has been working with other youth serving agencies to provide short land-based experiences for youth and include cultural elements which Sean and Jill were asking me about. They want to see if they can access our program to help their program, which they work for the Youth Achievement Center in Whitehorse. And so um, we have a three-day camp for elders planned for the end of this month, and we wanted to set it up something like a, a trapper's camp. So if you go to a trapper's camp, what do you see? What do you experience there? And so at the end of this month, uh, on the March 25th, 26th and 27th, we're going to have an elders camp, much much like a trapper's camp would be set up. There'll be, um, um, we've had two trappers going out, um, trapping some beavers and stuff and to bring into the camp and to show other people how to skin out a beaver. And um, we'll have tool making. We'll have other stuff like um, massage for elders, different things that will help the elders to feel comfortable and to enjoy themselves there. And it's just to have a really good time with the elders and, and then maybe jog their memories and we'll have storytelling. Um, what else are we gonna have out there? Um, yeah, tool making. There's gonna be other stuff. I just can't remember at all right now. Um, Jackson Lake Camp and other locations. The Jackson Lake Wellness Camp is located 30 minutes by road into the mountains from Whitehorse, which makes the program more accessible for resource people and families. It also makes it less expensive to operate and more accessible to emergency health and policing services if needed. The program has two days in which um, family, family visits, for family visits, we have two days given for that. And as well as we have two days for resource people to come in and um, share what they do and uh, for aftercare. Like we have Yukon College coming in talking about careers and different things. We have blood ties for health services. We have the health center coming in with nurses. We have um, different people that like housing to come in and say what they do and what programs they offer for people. So we have different days for that for aftercare. So that when the participants get out, they know the services that are out there and, and that they can access after they leave the program. Kuala Dunn First Nations has negotiated access to other First Nations traditional territories for land-based programming, hunting and fishing trips, which is important as all Yukon First Nations citizens are using the program and the hunting and fishing and trapping needs to impact more than one traditional territory. So we don't just keep taking from one territory, we can move around. Um, working together in partnerships, a variety of First Nations communities based in the Yukon government agencies are involved in delivering the pro of programs and we support them all. Um, anybody that's interested in our program and the way we can come in and support them with their participants um, that's welcomed and um, encouraged. The next steps include more closely with Yukon Alcohol and Drug Services to provide programs that braid together a person could do part of the program with ADS and part with Jackson Lake on the land. So we're looking forward to that. Um, the Kuala Dunn First Nations Health and now Champagne Ajac First Nations and other First Nations, we are building more capacity 
for providing both clinical and cultural supports to communities in crisis throughout the Yukon. Uh, right now, we're actually um, starting to develop a training plan to support people in the communities, um, the people delivering services uh, to the, uh, social services, anything like that in the communities. We want to develop a training plan so that we can work with them and in the way that they can work with their people with uh, supporting them with alcohol or uh, trauma or addictions, anything like that. Um, Kualandan invites other First Nations to use its documents, feasibility studies, assessment report, program models, evaluation reports, conference reports, and other information. Um, a one-week land-based healing school was also done with the su to support resource people in learning the methods through experience. So those are kinds of things that we're up to. Uh, Jackson Lake is dedicated to sharing experience, knowledge collected over the time, and other indigenous communities, organizations, and want to develop culturally founded and land-based programming. We're not saying we're the experts, um, but we do know what we do know. And with our elders we, that support us, we go along and we're there for other people if anybody else needs uh, support or wants our guidance or what we've known and what our experience was, we are gladly share that with other people. And so um, I have information that I, um, that I brought with me. It's a pamphlet on our program. Uh, we have the email and contact numbers for all of us in there. Um, and on behalf of Kwanlin Dunn First Nations, I'd like to thank you for inviting us out here to share our information. I got a call from the chief last night. She said, pass on her regards to the people in the uh, area here and at the conference. So thank you. Masicho. Thank you so much, Joe. Natasha, did you want to stand or sit? So the clicker's right there. Okay. You want to see Richard's impersonation of Elvis first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never live that one down. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll sit to start, and then I'll stand up to introduce. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am honored to be here. Uh, Diane Strand, who... Um, is an extraordinary, amazing woman, and I, I would definitely call her my mentor. Um, she is the Director for Community Wellness at Champaign and Ajac, and she had a, a last-minute family crisis that took her away. So I am stepping in for her. Um, so I'm sure I will, will, will fail at expressing what, what she can express, and I'm here to share my own heart, and, and as I sit here to realize that we're all here connected in love and in hope and desire to allow people to come into themselves, find that path, um, support one another, guide one another. Um, I was born in, in British Columbia. My mother and my sister now live in the Yukon as well. I've been in the Yukon for 10 years. Um, it's definitely where my heart beats the loudest. Um, I've tried leaving since I've been there and the mountains and the land call me home. Um, my, my father, he was a, a great believer in other things that uh, the world around us is a box that needs to be stepped out of. And he spent his life being dedicated to um, finding a different way a way that was about connecting with spirit, um, a way that was about being in community, um, that put family first. Uh, and I carry him, I carry him with me every day. Um, I have six siblings and 14 nieces and nephews and through our struggles we've learned that family is first and we spend a couple weeks every year out on the land together. That's our priority. We spend the whole year planning where we're gonna go, which is, very fun, and then when we get together, it's, it's the place where I feel safest, most loved, most alive. 
So I sit here with them right now as well. Um, and I, I just want to note that uh, we have uh, Chief Steve Smith, who is here, um, and, and, and Monica, and Sheila, and Marie, and Ayla, and Jenica, who are all here, um, to dance and coming, um, representing, and, and Peter as well, representing uh, Champagne Ajax. So we're all here together. Um, and they can answer questions that I could never answer. So um, with that, I will uh, just go into the programs. I've been working with Champagne Ajac for about two and a half years and um, with Kluwani First Nation for about three and a half years. Um, and I just yeah, find it an honor to be there and you know, to be part of community and, and to, to feel the welcoming of, of the land and of the people. Every day I count my blessings. Every day when I wake up, I look outside and I see what the mountains are doing and what the sky is doing and I, I think it will be a good day. Except for the days when I think today is gonna be a bad day. But <laughs> then the next day comes and it's good. <laughs> yeah. um, so starting with, I, I might stand over here just so I can feel connected to my grounding source. Apparently, I think more people fear speaking in public um, than they do death. So this is, uh, this is me being grounded. Um, I'm going to try. OK. So I don't know how many people here have had the absolute um, gift of being to Haynes Junction and Kiwani National Park and the mountains there. But it is, it is amazing and special. And as soon as people kind of drive in and, and crest the hill and see the mountains, yeah, they're captivated. They're drawn in. Um, Champagne Ajac also has communities. It's Champagne and Ajac. And then there's communities in Tokini and in Whitehorse. So it's a large, large land that is served. And a lot, a, a large scope for the government, always trying to understand how to serve all of its people, which I think we all know can be very, very demanding um, and not, not always easy answers. Um, so the purpose of this time together is really, you know, when I, when I talked to Diane and I said, what's important to communicate? What's important to have heard and shared? And it's very much this piece that John talked about this morning, which I just, I loved, loved, loved how he shared and how he spoke and how do we step back into, tra into tradition while at the same time honoring, mm, bringing in, bringing forward, connecting to the modern ways of healing, of being. Where is that interplay? How do we weave that connection? Um, and then of course, modern ways are everywhere. They've almost, they've, they've taken over, you know, um, we're all here with our phones, and I don't know how I could exist without my phone, and only a year ago, I, th I, you know, I thought I would never have one. Um, so it's about how to strengthen, how to strengthen the land, how to strengthen the traditional values so that there is that sense of balance. Um, and, and a really big part of community wellness and what we're striving for is to be connected to the voice of the people. And any time somebody comes forward and says, you know what? I kind of heard of this thing, and I think that it might help me, or if somebody tried out this you know, process, this type of healing, this way of, of, of learning, and I really want to try it. And we do everything that we can to make that happen, to bring programs up, to bring pro people from around Canada to um, do trainings. We just had uh, Suze Tetso, who is from, from here. She's actually in uh, Haynes Junction right now, and she did an amazing, amazing workshop um, on family virtues this weekend, and she's there all week, really supporting the families. Um, and it was incredible to participate in this, this sharing, because immediately what, what she brought was the value of the oral tradition. Right away, we were all put our, put our pens down, come together, let's find inner safety, let's find outer safety. And the circle just, whew, it came together. And to see the transition of people who were kind of resistant to being there, maybe their, their wives sort of dragged them in and said, you're coming or else. And, and at first, they you know, kind of had their backs up. And 
the way that she cast out shame, cast out a sense of we don't know how to get through this, we don't know what we're doing, and brought in, mm -mm, we know exactly what we need, and these are the stories that tell us what we need. And it was just like, it was, it was profound and beautiful and uh, so empowering, so um, connecting. And the, the energy at the end of the weekend was one of, yeah, I got this. I got this from inside of myself. And that came from the oral teachings, the, the tradition of story. Um, and she had a beautiful way of blending in some of the, you know, clinical trauma work, right, without having to say the words, right, talking about the spirit, talking about, you know, you know getting people together and, and, and actually doing sort of um, experiential learning where we had to get really frustrated and want to give up and want to quit, and yet we realized in that moment that we come together, and that's where our strength was, was coming together, not giving up, supporting each other, asking for help. So those are sort of the ways that we're looking to bring in more and more to community wellness, those ways that really, that really blend the different wisdoms. Um, so one of the areas that has been working really well for us, we have a, a weekly women's circle, um, and each year we have a, a women's camp on the land. Um, it's been amazing, this program. We really, at first we thought, okay, we're going to get together and sit and share and talk the whole time, and and kind of found that people didn't necessarily feel 100% safe starting out that way. And so that realization of, okay, well, then we spent a couple of, of weeks, what do you want? What's going to make this rich for you? What's going to help you on the path that you're on? And what's going to bring us together to create that safety without having to just sit and talk about it, right? And so it's, we bring in whatever, whatever we have on our long list that was created at the beginning, from gardening to pottery making to getting out of the land and harvesting, um, anything, that, anything people can think of, anything that, that we want to do, we bring it in, we make it happen. Different women volunteer to cook the dinner, so we all start off with the dinner, and then we go ahead with the programming. And it's been, yeah, it's been really beautiful to watch it evolve and to watch people engage, um, and the smiles and the sense of connection that's come with it. These are just some different examples. This was um, on our, the, the first camp we did, uh, Lorraine Allen and Audrey Brown, who just, wow, uh, you know, someone talked about agendas the other day and how we just throw them away. And that was exactly it. You know, you have this whole agenda. Yeah, we're going to do all this. And then Lorraine and Audrey come, and there is no agenda that can equal what they what they find in the flow, what they see is relevant in that moment. And we were just, we were just captivated the whole time. You know, we, um, we had Diet come, who's an amazing um, artist, musician um, from Kiwani Nation. And we wrote a song, and I'll play the song at the end. And it started out um, in English and then was translated into Southern Toshone and, and uh, later on sung for the, the premiere or somebody important, I don't know who it was, but um, yeah, it was a, a beautiful experience, and this is soaking our feet in uh, a sage foot bath, which we all loved very much, that, that real blend of getting outside, of taking care of ourselves inside, of learning to express, and finding a lot of different ways to do it. So this, uh, we made drums and sage kits um, at a different camp, we made uh, knives, this here um, is one of the uh, paintings that was created. We did a paintings workshop with Jean Taylor, and it is phenomenal, the art that was created in, I think, three or four days of every single person that participated. Um, so really, again, finding ways to create um, and express and experience. Um, we set some fish nets and got 37 fish. Um, yeah, it was, and then, well, then we realized that the whole agenda piece, oh yeah, you get 37 fish, then you have to process them and <laughs> learn how to dry them, and, you know, nothing else really matters once you get those fish in your net, right? And it's learning about letting go and just being, being with what arises. Yeah, just so many smiles and happiness. This is all of us 
cleaning. That was the first time I ever cleaned a fish. It was a beautiful experience. Um, this is one of our winter camps. So James Allen, who's a, um, a, a prior chief, he created and built an amazing um, healing camp on the land in his family's traditional territory. Um, and we've done a number of camps out there now. Um, and this is one of the, the winter camps. Um, we set fishnets, that's where we made the knives. Um, and just uh, would have sharing circles and did a blend. So in the mornings, um, Colleen, the facilitator, she would really lead through a, a sharing circle and kind of focusing on one teaching or another teaching. And then in the afternoon, we would get to really put that teaching to, to the land and, and let it have its space to be integrated. And these are other um, projects we've done throughout the year. So going out and picking berries, birch bark, um, learning how to plant and garden. We did pottery and painting and making sushi. It's kind of whatever, whatever we can imagine is what we bring forward. Um, the men's camp. So um, CFN has been offering informally there's been men camps offered at James Allen's camp and we've started now partnering just to um, allow for the greatest possible service so we now go to James Allen's camp and and support um, the last camp I think we had seven different facilitators you know we had a, a clinical psychologist come up um, and we had Joe doing the drum making and you know another counselor sort of doing um, circle processes and then uh, another elder doing traditional tool making so really um, bringing in that blend again. And there's the men making the drums and fishing and, and, and Chuck with the tool making. Just, you know, it's, it's so interesting. What I find is sometimes how difficult it is to get people out, right? We spend so much time planning and investing and, um, you know, I have a full list, 24 men who are coming the day before and then it comes the day of and it's like, where is everybody? There's nobody here. And, uh, and then as soon as, as soon as they make the transition onto the land, then it's like, okay, can we stay longer, please? Can we be here longer? And it's that, that reminder of that, that, that block, you know, that, that John talked about having to, to learn to step back into, into the land and into the tradition. And that once, once that the land is speaking, then it can't be ignored, right? So, how to create more and more opportunities to hear that voice. Um, we just did a leather making workshop with the men and it went extremely well. Um, apparently there was, you know, there was 10 men and like super focused. They, they didn't want to leave. They were so engaged. And one thing that we find is getting men engaged is, is more challenging than getting the women out. And so we, we're continually um, striving to build that sense of togetherness for the men. Uh, the family and parenting. This is a huge focus right now. Um, Chief and Council is very, very uh, motivated to build that sense of, of family values, bringing back um, that sense of connectivity that is is the way with um, with family. And so we've been we have a, a, a year long sort of. Um, plan ahead of us, bringing up different teachings once a month. Again, kind of shifting between um, some of the sort of oral, traditional-based teachings, and then you know next month we have uh, a group coming up doing um, something called Hold Me Tight, a couples counseling, and it um, it's some of the most cutting-edge sort of couples therapy work that's out there right now. So it's it's trying to offer a lot of different opportunities for family to get what they need. Um, we'll be doing a, a family camp this summer as well. So we've been focused a lot on the, the healing camps for men and women. And so now we want to uh, reconnect with a family healing camp. Um, and just some of the, the programs from community wellness. So community wellness in champaign Ajac has uh, about 17 to 20 um, employees. And I tell you, every single person works so hard, heart and soul. It's, you know, sometimes it's just, we kind of look at each other and we're just like, it's okay, we got this. And the other day I, when I walked into my, uh, my lovely coworker's office and I saw the look on her face. I said, wait one minute, I'll be right back. And I went and got a big 
pink ball, you know those balls that you can sit on? And I went and got it, and I brought it in, and I just started smashing it, and then she just started smashing it with me, and then we just started laughing and laughing, and you know, sometimes you just need those moments to say, yeah, this is hard work. It's hard work, and we keep doing it because, because we believe, and because we love it, and because we feel the, the joy, and um, the possibilities, and you know, if one person, if one person shows up to something and gets something out of it, that is more than enough value. Um, so yeah, we, we do community wellness weekends where, again, we just think of as many different opportunities for people to come together and share in different forms of wellness. Um, we did a community connects days this year and <laughs> the hall was filled. So people got, you know, a haircut, manicures, pedicures, massages. And it just, I just love seeing when people's bodies lift up. You know, the, the type of work I do is, is body-based, and so it's the belief that our stories are held in our bodies and working with our minds. You know, maybe that works for some people as a doorway in, but that our bodies hold our, our past. It's in our cells, and that we need to connect to our bodies to release that um, and to see how people's bodies change and shift when they have that sense of being cared for, being loved, being accepted, being valued. I think that's what we focus on. Um, and the youth programs, I'm not very connected with the youth, um, meaning with the youth programs, but um, Monica, who's here, if you have any questions, she has been, she said, she said today, she's like, I've been organizing youth camps for 20 years. You'd think they'd start asking the other youth to do it now. <laughs> but I guess when you, when you get... You know, when you're looked up and, you, and people see that you know what you're doing and they trust you and value you, then it's, uh, you're called upon, I'm sure, until you're an elder. Um, it's so the youth programs are um, amazing. When, when she was talking to me about everything that was going on, I didn't even actually realize how much is happening. She talked about uh, last year they did a, a Tatanshini um, whitewater rafting guide course and Tatanshini is not a light river. That is, you know, that's big stuff. That's stuff I, I would be pretty intimidated to be on there. And the youth were out there learning how to guide and learning those skills of, you know, just finding that confidence within themselves to lead others, which is so important. And, and heli skiing, <laughs> I think that's, I didn't know that was happening either. Um, and, and so many camps from language camps, uh, you know, harvest camps, they're just always happening. The youth are always coming out and getting, and getting out on the land. Here's some of the, the pictures of the amazing times. So there's the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Monica, but um, the, the Tatanshini guiding um, fishnets. What's happening up in the corner there? Wonderful. So she said they're the, the dancing there in Teslin for the, uh, the gathering last year. Yeah. Um, and she, she let me know about how... Uh, in, in how southern to Shoni that the picture of the the gophers are right there, and that's one of our elders, you know, doing the uh, setting the gopher trap and collecting the gophers and 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 singed gophers. Uh, it was just the other day where uh, Mary Jane was talking about um, in Whitehorse when she was when the the fire trucks came screaming down the alley to stop at her house and. She's like, what's going on? Why is the fire trucks here? And she was in the back singeing the gophers, and you know, someone didn't know what was going on. And now, every season, she just calls up and lets them know whenever she's going to do her gopher singeing. I'll be singeing gophers today, so you don't need to come. And uh, yeah, so it's a, a regular, valuable part of life. Um, and the moose hide tanning and, and the campfires. So as John talked about earlier today, you know, with every every campfire, our knowledge grows, right? So how, how, how important it is just to get out on the land and stay in the shelters and come together. What's, what's happening down in this picture, Monica? Ah, oh, so uh, I don't know if you heard that, but it's a soapberry ice cream contest. I would have liked to try that. I remember the first time I ever went berry picking and uh, I just brushed my teeth and I, I, was, I thought I hit the mother load of high bush cranberries and I picked tons and tons and tons and then I got home and because I tasted them out there, I was like, hmm, these taste interesting. And then I got home and I was like, 
these are not high bush cranberries. <laughs> so I learned very quickly <laughs> the difference. <laughs> Um, and the drum making, um, and then the importance of then being able to use the drums and hand games. And um, just uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a hand game tournament for Rendezvous, and I went and watched uh, watched our teams, and oh, just the life, the love, the f the laughter of coming together and just being with the music and the heartbeat, and yeah, it was um, extraordinary. So making these opportunities as often as possible. And these are uh, some of the youth right in there with the, the moose guts cleaning it out. We love that picture because it's just about, it's not about, you know, being on the sidelines. It's about getting right in and, and being part of, of, of it. And these are some fish scale art down there, which we love. Um, so this, now kind of shifting to moving forward and, and some of the big things that are happening for us, which we're really excited about. And, and Joe um, connected a little bit about um, to this program, alluded to it. Um, we're extremely excited about this. So um, CAFN has just um, taken the, the leadership of a three-year project um, that is a Yukon-wide project. Um, and the goal is to be creating and building a um, cultural and community supports program. And so it's, it's still kind of like, a, what does this even mean? And the idea really is to create a database. I, I really don't like that word, but I don't know what other word to use. If somebody else could tell me a better word, that would be great. But um, a database of all the, the cultural teachers, those that hold the, the wisdom, the, the knowledge, any, any skills that um, that maybe w we don't know about. You know, I, we've been in, in the Yukon, we've been wondering about, oh, where's the female fire keepers? Um, you know, sometimes the women say, I want to have a sweat, but I want it to be with a female fire keeper. And we're sort of like, mm, I'm not sure. Is this person one? Is this person one? We're not sure. And so um, being able to collect all of that, all of the that wisdom and, and Mary Jane Jim, who's been hired for this, she's actually going to go out into every community and get to know the community, um, talk, find out where are the people who kind of don't always come out, but they, you know, the elders, the, uh, the, the teachers that, that can add so much and contribute so much. Um, and then what will happen is that any community within the Yukon can call up and say, hey, we really need somebody right now to come support us, get our men out on the land, teach them a little bit about hunting, or, you know what, we've just had a little bit of, of a difficult time this winter, and we need some sewing to really kind of bring the women together, um, and it will all be paid for um, and um, easily accessible, um, and, you know, just starting to really value, bring that same level of value that... that I think people are working so hard to say, no, this, this must happen. Yeah, there's the clinical part. Yeah, that, that is important. Yes, we have enough of that. And not saying to stop funding that, but I mean, and we need to be making it just as accessible to have access to cultural supports. So we're super excited about that. And we're still kind of creating um, what that looks like. And so if anyone has ideas on how this could look, please um, you know, share if you're like, oh, wow, this would really be helpful if it looked like this. And we're in that real conceptualization stage right now. Um, this is another really exciting program that we have coming up, um, Strategic Resilience for First Nations. It's based off of um, a Strategic Resilience for Frontline Workers program that's been running at Langara College for over a decade. It's been um, a hugely su successful program. Um, it's won a number of awards, and now Diane Strand is working with Langara College to shift the program so that it is Northern based, that it, um, it incorporates ceremony, that it's very uh, relevant to the people living in the North, um, to the First Nations, um, and um, you'll be it'll be a certified program. You know, the whole thing about certifications, unless you have a certification, you don't mean anything, right? I mean, it's, it's horrible, and it's what, what, again, John was talking about. How do we kind of, you know, meet those modern needs while at the same time um, allowing the value for tradition 
to be acknowledged. And so this, the hopes with this is that that what might be what happens is that it kind of brings that forward, that balance. And so just again, what I was talking about, just how to uh, um, find those many wisdoms, many ways of bringing a spirit home. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll play the little music bit maybe right after Richard has a chance to talk, and if, if there's time. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Okay, Richard, you get the mic. Thank you, darling. Thank you very much. That's my um, impersonation of Elvis. Morning, folks. Um, my name is Richard Smith. I am the community. I am the cultural program coordinator for the Champagne Shack First Nations. My, um, I'm a Southern Toshone. I am of the Wolf Clan, and uh, my my Indian name, or my First Nations name, is Alala. Um, it's 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 a name that comes uh, from north of us. Uh, around the Carmax area, and my grandfather had named me that. Um, and he's named after a chief of an old place called Hudalinkwa. And alala, um, it means, you know, if you throw a stick in a river, how the river, how the stick would flow in the river, you know, it might, it might spin around here for a little while, and then all of a sudden get caught by the the current and get drugged down that way, you know. My mom was trying to explain it to me one time and I'm like, why don't I just call myself go with the flow, you know? <laughs> so and that, that's kind of how my, my life has been. Um, I'm not a very good public speaker and uh, I didn't even know I was gonna be up here until like two minutes before I, I got up here. So I don't have anything prepared. I'll talk a little bit about um, our First Nations and the programming that we do. Um, I work at a place called Daku, and it's a, a cultural center that we we just built. Uh, we opened in 2012, um, and you know, of course, you know, having a new cultural center, uh, we're open to visitors. There's a Parks Canada side. Um, uh, YG side, they, they also rent space in our building and they bring in a lot of visitors uh, from you know all over the world pretty much internationally. <laughs> and before the, the idea of Daku started, uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, background. Um, way back in the late 70s, um, early 80s, there was a, a prominent elder in, in our community actually in the Yukon who had um, who had the who told us our people we need a museum we need a place to keep our our culture safe uh, and that elder is uh, Elijah Smith who is our current chief's uh, father and our current chief is here right now so talk about pressure not to screw this up anyways <clears throat> so we have this Daku cultural center uh, started probably initially I think we started moving on this around 1994, shortly after we signed our umbrella final agreement, um, which is the land claims agreement in the Yukon, which gave our First Nations uh, self-governing powers. So we, uh, as a First Nations, uh, took this idea of a cultural center out to our people. So we had um, community consultation meetings, uh, in, all our, in all our communities within our traditional territory, and we asked our people, what do we want to see at this cultural center? What should we have there? So we have, um, we have this thing called an orientation exhibit when you walk into Daku, and this, this exhibit tells of our stories, um, our clan systems, our ways, uh, and talks about our, our struggles that we, we had to to establish um, a self, our, our self-governance. Um, and we also have a, an, a, an area, it's the changing exhibit area, 
and that that's an exhibit which we you know um, we work on to develop uh, and change out on an annual basis uh, this year's theme is harvest so everything to do with harvest we're gonna we're dis we're gonna display uh, last year's theme was art uh, the f we've been open since 2012 um, our first our first uh, exhibit was Guyat, which is beading. So you know we, we exhibited all our, our, our beadwork and you know from all our artists and elders um, in our First Nations. One of the struggles that I, I have as a cultural program coordinator is um, you know I, I've been really fortunate. You know, I've, uh, I'll tell you a story. You know, I'm a better storyteller than a, a public speaker. Uh, so I've been, to so I've been told. Um, I had an uncle, he was, he was, uh, he had cancer. And, you know, before, before I knew him, um, you know, I've always seen him as, uh, you know, somebody that drinks a lot, that drinks a lot, you know. He drank quite a bit. And, um. When he had cancer, he, he was somebody else that I didn't know, you know. He was real old school, uh, raised in the bush. And um, to see this side of my uncle um, as he was dying, you know, was, was uh, a real privilege to me. And, it, 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 you know, seeing that really grounded me, you know, it, it changed my perspective of life and just to listen to him. You know, I spent, uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Um, he told me this story. Uh, oh, a little bit more background. Like yesterday at the at at this conference, I heard words like magic, um, love, uh, you know, power of of our land, and this story kind of relates to that. Uh, it made me think of this story when I was listening to a lot of the speakers talk. Um, my uncle Billy Joe, when he was a little boy, he was like maybe two or three. He was just a little boy, and he said his, his mom and dad uh, went for a hunt and left him with his grandma. He said that first day they left, they left real early in the morning, I guess, sunrise. And uh, his grandma got sick. She couldn't move. She was in her bed, and he was only, it was just him and her. And he was only a little, a little baby, two, three years old. And uh, so... You know, the day went on, he said he got hungry and stuff like that. His grandma was really sick. And then his grandma told him, you see that glass over there on that, that table there? And he looked at it. She said, uh, go grab that glass. So he grabbed that glass, and then she told him, go down to the lake. He said, walk out into the lake, as far as you could go, maybe about your knee, he said. But, and he said, get some water and bring it back to me. And he was only two years old, you know, two, three years old. He was just a baby. So he did that, he said, and he brought it back to his grandma. And his grandma said, put that glass of water right there on the windowsill. So he did that. And then uh, waited, waited, and then he fell asleep. And then he woke her up, he, or she woke him up real early in the morning before sunrise. She said, get up, get up, she said. When you see that sunlight come through that water, I want you to bring me that, that glass of water. So he did that. He stood underneath the glass, and as soon as he see that sunlight go through the water, he, he grabbed it and he gave it to his grandma, and she drank it. And he said, before long, she was up, moving around, she got better. So that, that's just a story just to express the power that we have in our land and our water everything you know that um, that's what uh, the story I thought of yesterday when I was when I was at this conference anyways <clears throat> um, our, our my department I'm I fall under the LCH department the language culture heritage department uh, within Champion Ashak I believe there's seven departments eight departments uh, there's community wellness, uh, language, la um, language, culture, heritage, and lands. Uh, I think those three are pretty much the front lines um, 
for our, uh, you know, within within the Champion Ajax organization in terms of um, dealing with our members and, and our membership. Uh, Natasha pointed out, um, you know, it's, it's hard to engage the men. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I have uh, issues with uh, in my department. How do I get the men out there? You know, how do I um, develop program for men? Um, women, you know, easy through so a sewing class. You know, they're always uh, intuitive and they're, they're keen to, to attend. Um, whatever, whatever program that I, I host, like I, I just adver advertised a drum making course, a drum making workshop, um, actually with Joe Migwans. He's going to be doing that in a few weeks. Um, and for every program I do in my home community, which is Haines Junction, I mirror in Whitehorse. So I advertise it in both areas. Um, and immediately I got calls to, for people to attend. I only have like 10 spaces available in each community. Um, and women, it's, it's women calling, say, I want to do this, I want to do this. And fortunately, I got two men out of Haines Junction that are going to attend this, so you know, I'm, I'm really happy about that. I, um, I, I, I keep thinking of ways to, to engage men. Um, I, ha I just bought this huge roll of canvas, you know, just out of Edmonton, Halford Hyde. Um, so I have all this canvas, and I'm thinking, how about a dog pack? You know, we always had dog packs. So I'm going to do a dog pack making course. And like, how do, how do I um, magnify that? How can I take that further? So I'm thinking, how about if I do traditional hikes to or walks to our traditional, uh, old traditional villages within, within our community? You know, so, you know, and it just, you can build on, on one thing and just keep moving it. And hopefully, you know, I think, Men and land, you know, I think that that would, that would be the, the key factor in engaging our men, and especially, uh, you know, I really, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, helping those that are struggling with addictions, you know, alcohol and addiction. Um, so hopefully, you know, programs like that will reintroduce them to, to, to our land, yeah. How much time do I have? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll just uh, cut it short, and you know that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Well, that was that was great hearing uh, about programs from the Yukon, um, similarities, differences, and I know that you're going to have um, questions for them. We're moving into the lunch period. Um, the other groups are starting to come in. So on behalf of the group here, I'd like to thank the three of you very, very much for gifting us with your stories and your knowledge of uh, the programs in, in your territory. And uh, we look forward to hearing more stories from you. Thank you.